Depending on your teacher, school, country, or state, history classes might have been a nightmare for you or the most interesting subject in the world. Either way, you should know that not everything they taught you in class was 100% true, and there's a good chance that they might not have told you everything. But it's a new day. The truth really is out there, from Albert Einstein being a bit of a jerk to Christopher Columbus not actually discovering America. 20 eye-opening pieces of history they never taught you in school. Genius, but a terrible husband. Nowadays, when people Google the definition of genius, they find Albert Einstein's name in the explanation. Einstein is one of the most genius contributors to science. At age 26, he discovered light exists as photons and laid the basis of nuclear energy. At 34, he published the general theory of relativity. However, Einstein's accomplishments came at a cost for the people close to him. He treated his wife as an employee he couldn't fire, and while their first years of marriage are told to be romantic, things changed soon. Specifically, Einstein landed her a list of marital demands and only remained together if she agreed to the following conditions. His wife had to do all the cooking and cleaning for the eccentric genius. She had to maintain as little socializing with Einstein as he was not to be expected to keep her company or travel with her. She couldn't expect any intimacy and when asked, she had to stop talking. And she couldn't say anything belittling in front of their children. He literally had a checklist of behavior he considered unacceptable. Historians argue Einstein also erased his wife's contributions to the theory of relativity. Plus, Einstein cheated on her with his cousin whom he would eventually marry and also cheat on. Now let's get ready for today's missing topic. With a bug this size, it would probably be very helpful to have a military presence on hand. Some weapons wouldn't hurt either. In fact, judging from the position of this super bug, these soldiers look to have already subdued it and are moving in close just to get a look at it. How could you not? This unidentified insect is all sorts of heck no. But what is it? If spotting a silverfish or cockroach makes you uneasy, well, there's nothing compared to the giant bugs of prehistoric eras. Back in the prehistoric eras of planet Earth, there were some giant bugs to contend with, and though you definitely don't want to come across these extinct insects in your home or garden, who's to say some haven't survived remotely? An eight-foot-long scorpion? That's nightmare material. And they definitely existed in prehistoric days. This giant lived about 390 million years ago. This sinister scorpion would have been close to the top of the food chain during this time, and maybe we're looking at the Jurassic version of just such an insect. A giant bug created in a modern lab thanks to modern science. What do you think? Leave your thoughts below and make sure you don't hold back. Please include the hashtag missing topic. Hey, hey, did you know that if you smash the like button, subscribe, and click the notification bell, you're more likely to win the lottery? So what are you waiting for? The Pirate Queen. Forget Blackbeard, ignore Captain Jack Sparrow. You can forget about every other famous pirate ever, because the most iconic pirate captain of all time was a 22-year-old Chinese woman named Ching Shi. She was born into poverty in the Chinese city of Canton in 1785. But in a twist of fate, all that changed when she married the infamous pirate captain, leader of the notorious Red Flag Fleet. After his untimely death by a tsunami in 1807, his ambitious young wife managed to succeed him on the pirate throne, taking over the entire enterprise herself. As a female captain, she made herself twice as feared and twice as ruthless as any male leader. Anyone found breaking her strict code of piracy had their head chopped off with an axe and their body dumped into the ocean. No questions asked. Ching Shi also made sure that no women were mistreated by her crew members. Female prisoners were ordered to be set free unharmed unless a pirate wished to marry one. And if she agreed, she was to be treated respectfully as his wife. Nobody knew the value of a pirate's wife better than Ching Shi. With the Pirate Queen in charge, the Red Flag Fleet soon grew to control every major Chinese pirate organization. At its peak in command of 1,800 ships, 
and 80,000 pirates. Glow-in-the-dark wounds Early in the American Civil War, the Battle of Shiloh was fought in southern Tennessee on April 6 and 7, 1862. The Confederate Army lost the battle but sustained fewer casualties than the Union side. Unprepared for casualties on such a scale, medical help did not reach all of the wounded men for up to 48 hours after the main battle. When the field ambulances finally arrived, they were astonished to see that, as evening set in, some of the men's wounds were lit by a blue luminescent glow. However, the phenomenon of the glowing wounds was soon dismissed as an urban legend. In 2001, a 17-year-old schoolboy visited the battlefield, heard about the phenomenon, and came up with an explanation for the glowing wounds. He'd heard from his mother, who happened to do research on such bacteria, that luminescent bacteria are found inside tiny worms that flourish in soil. These bacteria do not generally colonize wounds in the warm human body, preferring the cooler conditions found in soil. However, the fact that the wounded lay out in the cold and rain meant that these insects would have been able to grow in the cooler conditions of open wounds. Their natural luminescence, while they grew in the wounds, would have produced the ghostly blue glow. Truth of Emancipation Proclamation As the American nation approached its third year of bloody civil war, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1, 1863. The proclamation declared that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are, and henceforward, shall be free. Despite this expansive wording, the proclamation had limitations. The document applied only to enslaved people in the Confederacy and not to those in the border states that remained loyal to the Union. It also expressly exempted parts of the Confederacy that had already come under northern control. Most important, the freedom it promised depended upon Union, aka the United States, military victory. Moreover, the proclamation announced the acceptance of black men into the Union Army and Navy, enabling the liberated to become liberators. By the end of the war, almost 200,000 black soldiers and sailors had fought for the Union and freedom. Although the proclamation did not end slavery, in the nation, it captured the hearts of Americans and fundamentally transformed the character of the war. It is my greatest and most enduring contribution to the history of the war, Lincoln said of emancipation in 1865, two months before his assassination. The Sinking of Titanic More than 1,500 passengers lost their lives when the Titanic sank en route to New York from Southampton in April 1912. And if you haven't seen the 1997 James Cameron film Titanic, well, you're probably one of the few people on Earth who hasn't. Anyway, while the cause of the disaster has long been attributed to the iceberg, evidence has surfaced of a fire in the ship's hull. The sinking of the ship may have been caused by an enormous fire on board, not by hitting an iceberg in the North Atlantic. A new analysis of rarely seen photographs has prompted researchers to blame the fire as the primary cause of the ship's demise. From the photos, experts were able to identify 30-foot-long black marks along the front right-hand side of the hull, just behind where the ship's lining was pierced by the iceberg. Looking at the exact area where the iceberg would eventually strike, it appeared to have a weakness or damage to the hull in a specific place before she even set sail on its iconic final voyage. The coal fire began during speed trials as much as 10 days prior to the ship leaving. Subsequently, when the Titanic struck ice, the steel hull was weak enough for the ship's lining to be torn open. The fascination with the Titanic, however, will never sink. Bell did not invent telephone. Generations of children were raised to revere Alexander Graham Bell as the inventor of the telephone. We learned about how his work with the deaf led to interest in the artificial transmission of sound, and how he filed the first patent for the telephone in 1876. But while Bell may have been the first to patent the telephone, he was not the first to have invented it. That honor goes to a little-known Italian immigrant named Antonio Miecci. After moving from Italy to Staten Island, he succeeded in building a functioning telephone in 1856, 20 years before Bell filed his patent. 
But unable to secure funding for his invention, it wasn't until 1871 that he finally applied for protection of his idea and one of his history's most bitter lessons, he accidentally omitted any mention that the variable electrical conduction in the transmission wires was to be converted to sound, the key point of the telephone. Whoops! To make matters worse, the laboratory he had been working with lost the functioning models of his invention. Five years later, Alexander Graham Bell successfully filed his patent for the telephone and has been credited with its invention ever since. Miachi tried to challenge Bell's claim but failed in court. He died nearly penniless and unknown to history until 2002 when the U.S. Congress officially recognized him as the true inventor of the telephone. Who discovered America? He's famous for discovering the new world. But did Christopher Columbus actually set foot in North America? The explorer is known for his 1492 discovery of the New World of the Americas on board his ship Santa Maria. In 1492, Columbus set sail for Palos in Spain with three ships. Between them, they carried about 90 men. After sailing across the Atlantic Ocean for 10 weeks, land was sighted by a sailor, although Columbus himself took the credit for this too. He landed on a small island in the Bahamas and claimed the island for the king and queen of Spain, although it was already populated. This initial encounter opened up the new world to European colonization, which would come to have a devastating impact on indigenous populations. So Columbus did not discover North America. He was the first European to sight the Bahamas archipelago and then the island later, named Hispaniola, now split into Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And today, his historic legacy as a daring explorer who discovered the New World has been challenged. His voyages launched centuries of European exploration and colonization of the American continents. His encounters also triggered centuries of exploitation of Native American populations. It was not the first flight. More than 80 articles from period papers and technical journals chronicle several successful flight tests by Bridgeport, Connecticut's Gustav Whitehead from 1908 to 1903. Evidence suggests that the German-born inventor began flying around the New England state nearly two and a half years before Orville and Wilbur Wright launched their now famous Flyer One in 1903. Will North Carolina have to relinquish its first-in-flight license plate slogan to Connecticut? It looks like it. On December 17, 1903, the Wright succeeded in getting the Wright Flyer One off the ground for a few flights of 10 to 20 seconds flying less than 20 feet in a straight line, about 10 feet off the ground. By contrast, local newspapers reported that on August 14, 1901, Whitehead piloted his plane over a half mile of Connecticut turf at an altitude of about 40 feet. A remarkable machine, Whitehead's aircraft had wings that folded alongside the sides of the fuselage so that it could be driven like a car as well. The controversy has been the subject of scholarly debate at various times over the past 110 plus years. The Wright brothers' impact on aviation was and is still huge. Nearly all airplanes are still based on their design. Even though Whitehead's plane was first, when's the last time you saw a dragon-winged boat flying overhead? The first non-stop flight. On May 21st, 1927, pilot Charles Lindbergh touched down in Paris, completing the first solo non-stop transatlantic flight from America. Just 33 and a half hours before, his single-engine monoplane, the Spirit of St. Louis, had taken off from Roosevelt Field, traveling an ambitious 3,600 miles. Promoted as the most astounding achievement of its day, Robert Ripley featured Lindbergh in Believe It or Not, his popular syndicated New York Evening Post cartoon. A few months later, Instead of celebrating the flyer, however, Ripley pointed out that Lindbergh, far from being the first person to make the crossing, was the 67th. It was Captain John Alcock of England and Lieutenant Arthur Whitten Brown of Scotland in 1919. English newspaper had initially offered a $10,000 prize, more than $1.1 million today, to the aviator who shall cross the Atlantic in an airplane in flight back in 1913. But World War I intervened in 1914, suspending the competition until 1918. The next year, on June 14, 1919, at 1.45 p.m., 
they began their bold journey across the ocean. 16 hours later, their aircraft touched down in a bog in Ireland. While the landing proved unceremonious, the UK pilots had achieved the impossible. These men achieved a milestone in aviation that some experts list on par with the 1969 moon landing. Carl Benz was the first inventor. Just imagine how our life would look without the car as basic transportation. We wouldn't have countries crisscrossed by freeways, there'd be fewer suburbs and no one would ever have to be trapped in a long drive through line. There wouldn't be drive throughs at all. Historically, Henry Ford is credited with bringing the car to the masses, which transformed driving from a pastime for the rich into an integral part of daily life for millions of people. But while Ford brought the cars to the people, he did not invent the car. Germany's Carl Benz is credited with inventing the automobile, according to historians. Benz, whose namesake car company Mercedes-Benz, builds ultra-luxury cars that bear little resemblance to the original cars Benz himself worked on, developed a gasoline-powered three-wheeled vehicle in 1885. By 1896, a year after Benz, Ford has built his own automobile. People do seem to like crediting Ford with innovation. The assembly line is often falsely attributed to him too. And while he didn't invent either the car or the assembly line, he did something that's arguably even more important. He combined and perfected assembly line manufacturing and car building. Ford didn't just want to build cars, he wanted to build a lot of cars. And he succeeded. It was not Edison. One of the most important inventions in history is the light bulb. Though Thomas Edison is usually credited as the man who invented it, the famous American inventor wasn't the only one who contributed to the development of this revolutionary technology. The story of the light bulb begins long before Edison patented the first commercially successful bulb in 1879. In 1800, Italian inventor Alessandro Volta developed the first practical method of generating electricity almost 80 years before. Made of alternating disks of zinc and copper, interspersed with layers of cardboard soaked in salt water, it conducted electricity when a copper wire was connected at either end. Volta's innovation is officially considered one of the earliest manifestations of incandescent lighting. Next, in 1850, English chemist Joseph Swan began trying to make electrical light more economical, and by 1860, he succeeded. Swan received a patent in the UK in 1878, and in 1879, he demonstrated a working lamp in England. So Thomas Edison sued for patent infringement. Where Edison surpassed his competition was in developing a practical and inexpensive light bulb. The two inventors eventually joined forces and formed Edison Swan United, which became one of the world's largest manufacturers of light bulbs. Crossing the Delaware more accurately. The American Revolution was a major victory for General George Washington during the fight for the colony's independence. But its artistic depiction, a staple in classrooms across the country, does not tell the whole story. In his 1851 portrait, Washington Crossing the Delaware, among the best known of American paintings, the artist, Emmanuel Lutz, did not shy away from imbuing the scene with a dose of glory. There are few images as enduring in American history as the one of the general standing tall in a rowboat gliding past many icebergs as he leads his troops across the Delaware River to start a surprise attack during the Battle of Trenton. However, the artist did not let the facts get in the way of his masterpiece. The only thing wrong with this historical image is the history part. In reality, sailing on cargo vessels that ranged from 40 to 60 feet in length, not the small vessel like in the painting, Washington was traveling with heavy artillery, horses, and many more men behind him. This is quite the contrast from the image portrayed in the painting. Washington's boat was much larger than is painted, and the flag in the image was not actually designed until after the event took place. This was simply more of a representation of what the event, and Washington specifically, symbolized. Fake Paris As far as military strategies go, this one might seem a little out there. Never has there been a more elaborate trick than what took place in Paris towards the end of World War I. The French built a second Paris, hoping to fool German bombers. Believe it or not, French military strategists believed that German pilots could be fooled into destroying a pretend Paris, rather than the real one, 
and so they set about building a life-size replica. This dummy city was positioned on the northern outskirts of Paris in order to bring the danger as far away as possible. Among the replica buildings was a copy of the Arc de Triomphe and the Paris Opera, as well as industrial suburbs and train stations. The designers tried to make it as real as possible, even from above, and so they wired each street with electric lights. The idea was to lure the Germans to drop their bombs there while the lights in the actual Paris were turned off at night. At the time of aerial attacks, there would be dim lights in the constructed fake Paris to make it seem like people were trying but failing to keep themselves undetected in the dark. Fake cities had limited utility, of course, but even in the history of deception, sham Paris was extraordinary. However, it was never actually completely constructed as the war ended in 1918. A Pro Wrestler it's difficult to wrap our heads around the idea of an iconic figure of American history being a wrestler, but there's much discussion about whether the 16th President of the United States was really a wrestler in his youth. The answer is yes. Abraham Lincoln was known for being a very good wrestler in his youth. Of course, Lincoln's wrestling exploits were not anything like the professional wrestling we think of now, or even the organized athletics of high school or college wrestling. In one particular wrestling match against a local bully in a small Illinois settlement became a beloved part of Lincoln lore. The eyewitness accounts tended to be the contradictory, and there are several variations to the story. The general outline, however, is that he stood up to a gang of bullies, and eventually Lincoln's wrestling past was mentioned in political campaigns. In the 19th century, it was important for a politician to demonstrate bravery and vitality, and that naturally applied to Abraham Lincoln. Political campaign mentions of Lincoln as a capable wrestler first seem to have surfaced in 1858, during the campaign in Illinois for the U.S. Senate. The grappling of Lincoln amounted to feats of strength on the American frontier, but despite his modest character, Lincoln the wrestler became the stuff of legends. Jailed for wearing pants, a kindergarten teacher made Los Angeles court history and struck a blow for women's fashion in 1938, Helen Hulick had been called to the court on L.A. as a witness of a burglary, occurred right inside her property. She came in front of the court by wearing pants, a piece of clothing that wasn't very common to see on a female body at the time. So the judge rescheduled her testimony and ordered her to wear a dress next time. The young woman, 28 at the time, declared bluntly to the press, you tell the judge I'll stand on my rights. If he orders me to change into a dress, I won't do it. And like a boss, she returned to court five days later in pants. This triggered the wrath of the judge, perhaps irritated by the bright colors of her look, green and orange. But she stood her ground, and again, the judge stopped the court. Ms. Hewlett was accompanied by her attorney who carried four heavy volumes of citations relative to his client's right to appear in court in whatever dress she chose. Listen, said the young woman. If he puts me in jail, I hope it'll help to free women forever. Sure enough, the next day, Hulick showed up in pants and the judge held her in contempt. She was given a five-day sentence and sent to jail. She did, however, return to court to testify after making her point, this time in a dress. Did Einstein really fail math? In 1935, newspaper headlines came forward that Albert Einstein, the greatest living mathematician, failed in mathematics. Einstein laughed. I never failed in mathematics, he replied. Before he was 15, the young genius had mastered differential and integral calculus. In primary school, he was at the top of his class and far above the school requirements in math. He even decided to see if he could jump ahead by learning geometry and algebra on his own. His parents bought him the textbooks in advance so that he could master them over summer vacation. He also tackled the new theories by trying to prove them on his own. So, why did the press start spreading these rumors? By the age of 12, he was studying calculus. Students would normally study calculus when they were around 15 years old. So how did the myth that he failed high school start? Easy! In 1896, which was Einstein's last year at one school, the school system of marking was reversed. A grade of 6, which had previously been the lowest mark, was now the highest mark, and so a grade of one, which had been the highest mark, was now the lowest. And so, anybody looking up Einstein's grades would see that he had scored lots of grades around one, 
which under the new marking scheme, meant to fail. Anti-tank dogs. Dog lovers, you're not gonna like this. Anti-tank dogs were dogs taught to carry explosives to tanks, armored vehicles, and other military targets. They were intensively trained by the Soviet and Russian military forces between 1930 and 1946, and used from 1941 to 1943 against German tanks in World War II. Soviet authorities approved the use of dogs for military purposes, which included a wide range of tasks such as rescue, delivery of first aid, communication, tracking mines, and people assisting in combat, transporting food, medicine, and injured soldiers on sleds, and destruction of enemy targets. A specialized dog training school was found in Moscow. Twelve regional schools were opened soon after, three of which trained anti-tank dogs. The dog's first major attack was a complete disaster because there was no cover from Soviet infantry. As a result, the Germans easily shot the dogs. In addition, the trainers had made a serious tactical error by training the dogs with Soviet tanks, which ran on diesel. The animals were accustomed to the smell of diesel, but German tanks used gasoline. Thus, the dogs were completely confused on the battlefield. By 1943, the situation on the battlefront had changed. As a result, they stopped using dogs for these missions. A fish to get high. The Romans were famous for utilizing the land to display their status as well as ensuring their own survival by utilizing plants and animals for food, cosmetics, and dyes for clothing and crafts, as well as for medical purposes. But something that was not quite as well known of the Romans was that they used a fish called Sarpa Salpa as a recreational drug. It's not unusual today to hear about plants being used as drugs, as they are today, but perhaps it's unexpected to hear that the ancient Romans like to get high too. In Arabic, the fish's name means the fish that makes dreams. The unique fish is an inhabitant of temperate and tropical areas, from the Atlantic coast of Africa and up throughout the Mediterranean Sea. Although it may appear as a normal fish living in these waters, the Romans knew that it can induce vivid hallucinations. The fish causes hallucinogenic effects after it's consumed. This is characterized as a type of food poisoning that can manifest with vivid auditory and visual hallucinations, delirium, disturbances in motor coordination, nausea, nightmares, vertigo, and other disturbances to the central nervous system, according to reports. The effects are something to do with the fish's diet, although it's currently unclear exactly which toxin causes the response from those who eat the fish that gets you high. A senator horse. According to ancient historians, the Roman emperor known as Caligula loved one of his horses so much that he gave the steed a marble stall, an ivory manager, a jeweled collar, and even a house. Supposedly, the horse had 18 servants for himself who fed the animal oats mixed with gold flakes. That horse was Caligula's prize racehorse, and he got special treatment for it. If you lived near a stable, your whole neighborhood had to keep silent the day before each race so it could concentrate. Most famously, it's reported that the owner made the horse a senator. The accuracy, however, is generally questioned. Historians suggest that later Roman chroniclers were influenced by the political situation of their own times, when it may have been useful to the current emperors to discredit the earlier emperors. Also, the lurid nature of the story added spice to their narratives and won them additional readers. There's no such thing as bad press, as they say. Scholars suggest that the treatment was an elaborate prank intended to ridicule and provoke the Senate, or was perhaps a form of satire with the implication that a horse could perform a senator's duties. Records say that the owner wanted to appoint his equestrian bud to the Senate, but was assassinated before he could make it happen. The War of the Worlds The War of the Worlds was a Halloween episode of the radio series directed and narrated by Orson Welles as an adaptation of H.G. Welles' novel, The War of the Worlds, that was performed and broadcast live in 1938. The episode is famous for inciting a panic by convincing some members of the listening audience that a Martian invasion was taking place. The first portion of the episode climaxes with a live report from a rooftop in Manhattan, from where a correspondent describes citizens fleeing in panic from giant Martian war machines, releasing clouds of poison smoke. The broadcast has become famous due to the breaking news style of storytelling employed in the first half of the show. The illusion of realism was supported by the lack of commercial interruptions, 
which meant that the first break in the drama came after all of the alarming news reports had taken place. Some listeners heard only a portion of the broadcast and mistook it for a genuine news broadcast. Thousands of them shared the false reports with others or called newspapers or the police to ask if the broadcast was real. Many newspapers assumed that the large number of phone calls and the scattered reports of listeners rushing about or fleeing their homes proved the existence of a mass panic. Obviously, the Martian invasion never happened. Either we're all walking away from this video clip with the thought, wow, the more you know, or the other thought, what the heck were they even teaching us in school? Being closer to the truth is ultimately a win-win either way. 